everyone. This is Rosemary Coates in Silicon Valley. I'm your host for this edition of Women in Manufacturing. I'm the executive director of the Reshoring Institute, where we help companies bring back or expand their manufacturing in the US. I also run a global supply chain, manu uh, supply chain consulting firm where we help clients with global supply chain projects and where I also do expert witness work. On these podcasts, we interview accomplished women in business and ask them to share their experiences with us. Until today, I am delighted to welcome my very special and brilliant guest, Cheryl Texan. She's an award-winning principal R&D engineer at National Instruments in Austin, Texas. And welcome, Cheryl. Uh, it doesn't look like you, you're in Austin in the background. Where is the, where's the background of your, for your Zoom? Uh, yeah, so the background is a photo that I got to take when I uh, went on a cruise to Antarctica in 2019. So uh, one of the last last major trips I was able to take recently. Yeah. That's terrific. It looks beautiful. It looks gorgeous. All right. So with that background, we'll we'll assume you're a world traveler <laughs> and get started talking a little bit about your fantastic career. So let, let's start off, if you will, tell us about your educational background, because I know you have you have uh, gone to a special place to learn engineering. Yeah, sure. Uh, I went to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I was an undergrad in electrical engineering. Um, and then they have a program where you can also uh, stay on and do your master's as well. So I have a master's of engineering and a bachelor's in electrical engineering from MIT. Okay. And is, is your master's degree also in electrical engineering or is it more as a general engineering degree? Yeah. So my thesis was on uh, signal processing and basically optical flow for uh, image analysis. Okay. That's, that sounds like way beyond my pay grade. <laughs> you're you're in research and development now as an engineer, right? Can can you explain how that kind of engineering differs from other engineering disciplines? Yeah, so the research focus is a little bit on the the early uh, technology readiness level uh, side of the scale. So there's a lot more prototyping. There's some research, some you know investigating white papers and evaluating how different techniques might uh, result in a solution that you're trying to produce in order to serve the market. Um, the company that I currently work for actually builds test and measurement equipment. So a lot of what we do also has a focus on building the equipment that our customers are able to use in order to validate and uh, ensure the quality in their products. So we have um, a little bit of a different spin on kind of what we're trying to put out, but the rigor of the research and product development process is similar. So, so um, to explain a little bit, so you take an idea or a technology direction and develop it from there. Is that the idea? Yeah. So the business unit that I'm in, we I'm actually part of the systems R&D team. So we have at the company a product R&D team, and they're developing the modules and the base components that uh, we sell, and you can buy them individually. My my team takes those. Uh, product lines and basically puts them together to make a larger system. So we're building an advanced solution on top of our um, uh, kind of front of the line hardware in order to put that system together to serve a customer purpose. So we work closely with our business development and our marketing folks to understand what customers are trying to do. Um, and learn about the solutions that they would like to see. And then we basically ideate on what we have coming out of our, our product R&D teams and think about how we can put those pieces together. We also make requests back into the product R&D team for you know, future features that help us to build that uh, system level solution. Um, and then we turn that around and, and can sell that to the customer as something that serves the need that we've seen in the market to support their, their efforts in testing whatever systems they're putting in the field um, company. So, so it's an integration of various parts, right? Is you're looking at how they operate together or don't operate together or uh, how they might integrate in terms of uh, hardware and software. Is that right? You do software too. Correct, yeah. So um, while, we do have a lot of software layers. A lot of the technical 
engineering behind it comes down to, you know, what the product is actually capable of at a low level. So I work for uh, the aerospace and defense and government uh, industry. And a lot of the requests that we have specifically in the electronic warfare radar area communications, uh, which is kind of my focus area, um, a lot of the requests are for things that have a lot of tight timing alignment. So for example, if we take multiple uh, transceivers, so RF equipment that is basically looking at some piece of the spectrum and it is receiving or transmitting energy in that uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum, um, we might need to take multiple of those and we might need to very tightly timing uh, align and synchronize across those different devices. So there's somewhat of a hardware limitation and, and how that product was put together and what we can achieve as far as the, um, the tolerance and our ability to, to synchronize the equipment. Um, and then we also have software that allows us to control some of the hardware and physical components in order to um, get to the performance that we're looking for. So it's a mix of understanding a lot of the hardware and analog components and then manipulating those in the digital domain via software or other controls. So you say, I suspect you're very often the smartest person in the room, right? Depends on the room, but yeah. <laughs> So I'm um, doing this this kind of work in developing and engineering. So are you directed or is it more experiment experimentation? In other words, this, does someone, your manager or somebody in the company or someone in the government tell you, we want to go in this direction and develop this kind of thing? Or is it, are you on your own just experimenting with different ideas? Uh, so, so my company is fairly large. And even within the, the industry focus area that I work in, you know, we do have a team of people, right? So uh, there's always uh, different roles, but there's a lot of overlap. So, uh, you know, I come in with the technical experience and understanding, and we have, you know, sales and marketing people that are analyzing market data. They're talking directly to the customers a large portion of the time. They're trying to understand what the customer is trying to do. But if you, know, you have people that have less of a technical background, sometimes they don't know which questions are the most critical to be asking or to really understand at a low level. So I do get to go visit with customers um, and try to sometimes understand not necessarily what they're saying they want, but what they actually need to address a problem that they're seeing uh, with you know, the current equipment that they might have. So there's a little bit of that um, probing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th this is interesting because I'm from the consulting world. It's it's kind of the same thing. I often get told there's a, a vague problem or some issue or down the road they see something or another, but don't know exactly how to describe it or um, how to solve it. And so a lot of the effort that's made, just as you were describing, is in drawing the customer out and trying to understand exactly what it is that they're trying to achieve and then addressing it that way. So, so interesting. So, uh, so you start with the basic kind of understanding of an issue or a direction and then draw out, you know, where they're trying to get to and then solve it from there. Is that right? Uh, yep. Uh in short form, yeah, it's, okay. it's about there. Also dealing with a lot of co government customers, you know, the government has a history of having uh, really long life cycles for their programs. And so while that is shifting and um, they're moving to this more agile development workplace and trying to uh, it, stay more on top of, of current technology, a lot of the uh, engineers that are working in some of these government environments are used to having, you know, a published list of, of requirements that they're working towards and they have an, a deep understanding of the system that was the previous solution. And so a lot of those conversations are sometimes trying to pull out, well, when you say our existing system does this and we need the new one to do the same, is there really flexibility? Is that a hard requirement? Um, you know, Is there a reason that they did it that way in the past that maybe doesn't apply anymore? Um, and, and trying to leverage their experience while also looking forward to what you know newer technology can add um, in terms of the value that they're looking to get out of it. Sure, because the technology is always evolving. So trying to help them overlay kind of new approach and new ideas and new direction on top of a, an old system, right? 
Yeah, and some of the some of the constraints that they were working under in the past no longer apply, right? So you might have a requirement that was very specific to addressing an issue in old technology that doesn't exist 20 years later. I was uh, at a semiconductor manufacturer, um, a contract manufacturer the week before last, and they showed us one little section where they're still doing through hole um, and soldering through wave soldering and through hole, which is an old technology. But they said they maintain it because they have government contracts and there are so many government systems that still have a through hole technology instead of surface mount technology. And so I thought that was kind of interesting. I was a, a little surprised, but they said, you know, so much of the government systems are, you know, 40 years old, 50 years old. Uh, and they have to maintain that um, because it's a some kind of critical system or another. Uh, so pretty pretty interesting trying to integrate what what's new and what you know and what's evolving into um, people that are maybe products, not people, but products that are stuck in the past, right? Very interesting, very interesting. So, you know, long ago in my career, I worked in uh, uh, defense at a defense contractor in San Diego. And I remember, you know, we had um, additional restrictions and additional kind of audits going on all the time and additional permissions that were required. And uh, it was a different kind of environment from a commercial environment. Are, do you still have that? Do you have just a government have oversight on the kind of things that you're working on? Yeah, so that depends largely on the type of contracts that you're receiving from the government and the uh, level of um, government work that, that your company has. So at my current company, we're not... Uh, entirely a defense contractor. So we do not have any ability to hold classified information or anything like that. So we don't have the government restrictions on uh, certain types of facilities and control over you know, that level of documentation and software and, and process around that. Um, having previously worked where there were those, those types of restrictions, yes, the government can uh, add a lot of, of overhead and rules that again, have, have a history of, of rational development behind them. And it is- It slows you down, right? It slows you down from, it, yeah. It can. One of, one of the biggest things about isolating different programs is that you can have multiple programs that are essentially developing the same type of technology. And the people working on those programs are not allowed to tell each other what they're working on and share that information uh -huh. and kind of leverage the work that's been done behind those walls. So- um, you have to get a little bit lucky to have, you know, program managers or engineers that are uh, working on multiple programs to be able to bring that information across. And then, and even then, sometimes you can't share uh, that information directly, um, and you need to go through a whole process in order to be able to to back that out and and move it over and get leverage. Uh, the company that I work for currently, um, again, we have less of those restrictive elements in terms of handling, you know, classified information and, and government, uh, government confidential type information. But uh, so we do have a, a lot more ability to collaborate and reuse pieces and develop such that we can get leverage out of work that we've already done. Oh, okay, okay, well, that's great. That saves us all as taxpayers, right? <laughs> yes. On the other side of your company, on the commercial side, what kind of products are being developed and, and sold on that side? Um, Just so we so, understand a bit more about your company. Sure. Yeah. So the other two industries that we're heavily focused in is semiconductor and transportation. So uh, electric vehicle battery testing. Um, uh -huh. And then on the semiconductor side, uh, I believe a lot of uh, production line testing. So uh, we have a lot of software that aids in, you know, chip manufacturers and then being able to verify that all of the chips coming off the line meet whatever specifications they were put in place for. Um, uh, and so it's it's interesting when talking to people from the different industries, you know, the aerospace government area tends to do a lot of uh, larger purchase, lower volume type orders. Um, they buy small sets of equipment for testing very specific types of uh, military products. So for example, you know, the F-35, right? You don't build thousands of them 
every month, right? You, you build a few yeah. over years. So they don't need that level of, of test on F35. They need high quality test, but they don't need thousands of right. test stations or iterations, right? Yeah, so the demands for the semiconductor industry, which you know is updating their products every year, they need to develop new uh, test solutions for each new chip that gets delivered and they need to crank out many of them puts a different test burden on the solution that you provide to support their ability to, to get those out to their customers. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And of course, you know, we all know the semiconductor shortage is, is driving a lot of development across the country for new semiconductor manufacturing sites all over the place. I was uh, in upstate New York a couple of weeks ago, and they have a big semiconductor plant that just went in uh, there. And of course, the Biden administration is focused on uh, semiconductors as one of four critical industries to continue to develop over the next uh the next decade and to be competitive worldwide that's what we need and and it's causing all kinds of shortages in the u.s right now um as you probably know so that's nice and even though you don't work in that area i'm sure um you know the company having technical resources in that area is helpful uh and uh, will certainly help the company grow anyway going forward well that's great um so i want to change subjects a little bit topics a little bit and talk about uh, how you, as an engineer, fit into um, engineering departments and companies where you must be one of very few, if maybe the only female engineer in the group and the smartest one in the group, right? Sure. <laughs> so how, how do you work in that kind of environment when, you know, you're kind of the only one? Yeah, so, I mean, also specifically being in, you know, the the military space that usually also kind of weeds out a lot of uh, women being involved. So I've always found that having a strong voice and really standing up for myself has been critical to being heard. Um, there is a little element of kind of making sure they can't overlook you um, yeah. and then just being really strong and confident in the work that you can do and in the uh, the background and the training that you have to be able to contribute. I think that's the, the primary thing. I've also found that building a network of people that may not be directly on your team, but with whom you can uh, bounce ideas off of or get a read on, you know, was this something that I should be concerned about? Or is this sort of the usual day-to-day -day interaction? Um, having you know, even a group outside your team has been really valuable. So I've been heavily involved in the Society of Women Engineers. I'm currently the president of the Austin section um, that provides kind of a support network of women who have not just my type of engineering background, but have been in engineering fields across, you know, across multiple industries with different types of training, learning from their experience and understanding how they navigate situations and the types of, you know, issues that they run into. And then within my company, we also have an employee resource group um, focused around you know, women and being able to work with those women and understand how different departments operate and also to be able to elevate any issues that may come up up to you know, our C-suite and um, really build that into, uh, now we have some, some company goals around making that environment better, not just for women, but for other minority groups as well. And so, um, I've been lucky in that most of the teams that I've worked for have been uh, supportive and inclusive, but um, we are still working towards, you know, an environment where you don't have to wonder if uh, interaction is, you know, because of, you know, me being female versus, you know, how, how a, a man would have, you know, engaged in the same type of situation, so. Uh, me too. Be, having come up through the ranks in logistics and transportation management, I was very often the only female in the room. Uh, and I had a sort of, I always felt like I had to sort of earn my stripes and, and work harder. Uh, but, you know, once you establish credibility uh, and you are, you know, not hostile <laughs> and easy to work with and um, are bright enough to solve problems, you, you slowly earn respect and I think your, your place in the workplace. It's, um, you know, it's sort of unfortunate we're still, uh, unfortunately, that we're still, as women, developing that place 
uh, instead of just expecting it and walking in and saying, you know, I'm part of the team, I'm, I'm, you know, going to play on a even playing field that there's still some, some work to be done in that area. I think it's wonderful that you are um, in uh, associations that help and support you. That's a, that's a really important tip, I think, for, for women is to find groups that can, can in fact support you and, and help you can, Continue to develop your career. So that, that's really great. That's very helpful. What kind of activities does the association do? do you, is it like dinner meetings or something like that? Yeah, so there's a variety, right? And each section has their own uh, activities that they put together, but it ranges from, you know, get togethers and kind of get to know you type activities. We do happy hours and brunches. We also put on professional development um, activities where, you know, we'll have speakers come in or we'll do workshops to help people, you know, build things like uh, their resume or, you know, discuss uh, career opportunities and how they might want to get ahead. There's a lot of resources through the society on their website with training material um, around understanding diversity, about overcoming, you know, potential bias in the workplace, also about many different career development um, uh training modules that people can work through. One of the things that I really like about being a part of the Society of Women Engineers in particular is they have a lot of opportunities for things like public speaking and for uh, putting yourself out for awards that align with the society's interests. So um, I was able to, in practicing my public speaking, I was able to apply for and get an opportunity to speak at both the We Local, which is the smaller regional conference, and then also the national conference, which draws, you know, tens of thousands of people. Um, and it's a three day event with multiple speakers. So if you're looking to develop some of those skills, that can be a really great opportunity to showcase them in a, in a place where you don't necessarily need your manager to put you on the spot in a directly work related event. Um, the awards are similarly a great way to be recognized for things that you're already doing. There are awards that tie into your technical background. So for, um, being an, an engineer and doing great work. Uh, there are awards that will recognize individuals for that, but then there's also a, a bunch of awards that will recognize volunteer work and um, you know, the promotion of women in engineering. And so if you're really excited to work to drive change uh, throughout, um, it, you know, throughout the engineering field, then you can actually get recognition for this um, through the Society of Women Engineers. And I'm sure there are other avenues as well. Uh, for me, it was really nice to go for one of these awards because I had been heavily involved in a group at work that was, you know, basically trying to promote better inclusion and understanding of these issues in the workplace. And as part of that award, I was able to get a recommendation from my CFO to, you know, support that endeavor. And so having that connection with, you know, an award that I was able to receive that is from a nationally or internationally recognized organization that also had the support of my CFO really is a, a career boost and, and highlights how, you know, this volunteer passion in- What was the investment. award? What was uh, that? It, it was, uh, I'm blanking on the name of the award, uh, Work-Life Balance Award. So basically um, to help women integrate their ability to, you know, be themselves and have their own life outside of work while also being uh, successfully engaged and um, develop their career as well in the workplace. What's uh, what's your work-life balance? What do you do when, when you're not at work? Uh, yeah, so when I'm not at work, I do live in Austin. So there are a lot of uh, music shows and um, I attend those fairly regularly. There's a lot of great places to eat and drink around here. Um, when we're in the winter where the weather's actually great, uh, there's a lot of outdoor activity and parks and, and different things to do uh, outside. So Austin is a fun city. Summer's too hot to be outside, so. Yeah. And then prior to the pandemic, you used to travel a lot all over the world, right? I did, yes. Uh, usually was a fairly regular, regular traveler. Um, the pandemic sort of shifted that to more of the road trip uh, type as opposed to flying all over, but. Where's your favorite place in the world? Antarctica was a really fabulous trip. And if there was an easy way to spend more time there, I think it would be, it would be amazing to, you know, be able to get into the interior and um, 
kind of see see how living in it would be. Oh, that's great. And you've also you've also been to Europe and Asia, right? Yes, uh, both Europe a few more times. I did have the opportunity to go to uh, Beijing and Shanghai, uh, which was a lot of fun. And then um, I've spent a, a little bit of time traveling Europe. There's never enough time um, to actually see everything that that all of these places have to offer. Yeah, that's terrific. Well, Cheryl, um, we're running out of time here. So just tell us um, what's next for you? What's your career path? I mean, have you planned it out? Do you know where you want to go next or what you want to do next or what kind of products you want to work on? Uh, the planning is in the works. I have some ideas. So like I had mentioned, I've been working on you know some public speaking and I've also been working a lot on, on leadership and being able to uh, get people to do their best work. And so, you know, I'm considering what it would mean to shift from being a individual contributor over into a management role. Uh, but there's also the potential for a lot of leadership opportunities within that technical role as well. So I really enjoy, you know, watching more junior engineers come up and uh, watching them learn and, you know, come up with creative new solutions based on um, their backgrounds to uh, kind of tackle some of these problems. So I, I like the idea of being able to guide other people and develop a solution with a team um, in the future. That's great. Yeah, I think a, an awful lot of women, well, and, and I think people in general, men included, um, you know, get start their career and they don't, they just sort of let it flow along instead of planning what they want to do. And I think it's much more effective if you have a, a plan in mind, if you want to be a manager or you want to be an executive or you want to work in a specific industry to develop that plan and know what it is and, and work toward getting there. I think that's, a, and that's an important part of, of your career and certainly will build your career as time goes on. Um, so I would... I would yeah, I would add to that, that tell other people what your plan is, right? So, you know, if you have managers that are interested in, in you having the best success and staying with the company, letting them know what your goals are, even if it is a shift from your current role, people can't help you get there if they don't know what you're looking for. So really being able to communicate what you're looking for. Um, some of these roles don't exist until you make them up. So, uh, right you kind of have to describe what it looks like and then see if there's a fit either at your company or a different one. Yeah, terrific. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us today, Cheryl. It was, it was fascinating to talk to you and I, I wish you all the best luck and success in your career. Um, for our audience, you can listen to more podcasts on Women in Manufacturing website, uh, www.womenandmfg.com. And um, Cheryl, can you give us your contact information? Sure. Uh, you can reach me at cheryl.texan at ni.com. Uh, I don't have a personal website, but the, the Society of Women Engineers is at sweet.org if you want more information about that organization. Sweet as uh, uh, swe.com. Is that right? Dot org. Yeah. Dot org. SW.org. Okay, very good. And you can reach me, Rosemary Coates, at r. Coates, R-C-O-A-T-E-S, at reshoringinstitute.org, and visit our website, www.reshoringinstitute.org, where we publish all of our research on manufacturing in America. Thank you again. Have a great day. Thank you.